Good morning everyone. Today we'll be having our lecture in the park as it's such a beautiful late summer's day. Last week I introduced principal component analysis and exploratory factor analysis. Principal component analysis was just a rotation of the axes of our data. There was no modeling involved. And I already explained that exploratory factor analysis is a very simple rudimentary model of the covariance matrix of your data. Now today I want to build upon that idea of exploratory factor analysis and introduce the topic of confirmatory factor analysis to you. First, I'll be introducing the difference with EFA. Then we'll be discussing scaling issues in latent variable models. We'll discuss model fit, um, both the basic chi-square test and other indices of model fit. And finally, I'll lay the foundation for next week's topic, which is introducing means and intercepts into our latent variable models. Let's go. So first, let me emphasize the distinctions between EFA and CFA. We do EFA when we're doing an inductive approach to theory development. For example, we've administered a lot of items related to morality, but we don't yet have a theory as to the structure of morality. In this case, EFA can help us decide how many distinct components are present in the data. Confirmatory factor analysis, on the other hand, is a more deductive technique. We use it when we have an a priori theoretical model for our data. In EFA, the number of factors is often determined a posteriori. That is to say, we compare solutions with a different number of factors and we have tools such as parallel analysis to help us decide what the optimal number of factors is. In other words, this is a data-driven approach. In confirmatory factor analysis, the number of factors is always specified a priori. And in fact, we have to decide which items belong with which factors. This makes it a very theory-driven approach. In EFA, all of the items load on all factors, and it is an empirical question how strong the loadings will be of each item on each factor. In confirmatory factor anal analysis, on the other hand, we decide which items load on which factors, which means that some of the loadings have been fixed to zero. In EFA, we often use an oblique rotation or an orthogonal rotation to make sense of our factors, to interpret them after we've estimated the model, and in confirmatory factor analysis, no rotation is necessary. We can, however, specify which factors are allowed to correlate. Another thing is that EFA can be conducted in most statistical packages. For example, SPSS can do it off the cuff, the R package Psyche can do it. And for confirmatory factor analysis, we need dedicated structural equation modeling software. Now, in the free open source software environment R, we typically use the package LAVAN to estimate our structural equation models. So let me take you back to last week and show you a picture of an exploratory factor model. In this case, we see that a two-factor solution is estimated and each of these factors loads on all of the five items in our data set. And let's have a look at those items. We see that there is an item called withdrawn, one called somatization, that means the extent to which psychological pro uh, problems manifest physiologically, anxiety, delinquency and aggression. Now if we estimate this exploratory factor solution, then we're probably going to see that the first three items load strongly on one factor and the final two items load strongly on another factor. We might also see that if we allow an ob oblique rotation, that these two factors are probably correlated as problem behavior typically manifests itself in different ways. So we might see that both what we call the internalizing problem behaviors, uh, such as being withdrawn, anxious, and displaying somatization problems, and the externalizing problem behaviors, which is that you act out uh, on other people, are associated with one another. We could, however, also take this theoretical background knowledge and involve it when we build the model we could say, well, we have a pretty good idea that the first three behaviors are internalizing problem behaviors and the final two behaviors are externalizing problem behaviors. Why don't we specify our model a priori in such a way that there is one factor which we label internalizing, which has loadings on the first three items, and we have a different factor which we label externalizing, which has loadings on the final two items. Of course, using our theoretical knowledge, we could allow these two factors to be correlated. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this picture. We can see that following the graphing convention, um, we see 
directional arrows from the latent variables towards the observed items, and these we term factor loadings. And their interpretation is the same as any regression coefficient. In other words, if the internalizing factor goes up by one point, then the score on the observed variable anxiety goes up by b points, however big the factor loading is. We also see that the latent variables have a arrow pointing from the variable to itself, which indicates a variance. We call this the factor variance. We also see a two-directional arrow between the two latent variables, which indicates a factor correlation. And finally, we see these little latent variables hanging onto the observed variables with a loading of one, and this is the term for the residual variance. So, when we estimate a model like this, we need to devote some attention to the question of scaling. What scale does our unmeasured latent variable have? Now, let's think about some measured variables and their scale. For example, if we measure people's height, we can measure it using um, a tape measure in centimeters, and the scale will be centimeters. We could also administer a questionnaire with Likert type response items from one to seven, and maybe our questionnaire is about happiness, in which case we could say we've measured happiness on a scale from one to seven. That is its scale. Now the problem with latent variables is that they capture something that we did not measure. Remember, we use our observed variables as indicators of an unmeasured latent variable. So what is the scale of something that we did not measure? Well, the answer is we define the scale. And we can define the scale in two different ways. The first way that we can define it is to fix the factor variance at one. Then basically we say this latent variable is a standardized normal variable with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. The interpretation then becomes a plus one standard deviation increase on the latent variable is associated with plus one times the factor loading increase on the observed variable. A different way to set our scaling is to fix one of the factor loadings to the value of one. This means that the scale of the latent variable becomes linked to the scale of that observed variable. If that latent variable increases by one point, then the observed variable also increases by one point. Both of these two ways are valid. The only difference is how we interpret our model parameters. So let's look at this in a graphical manner. So each factor needs to be assigned a scale. For example, we could scale the variables by fixing their variance to one. Then we have standardized normal latent variables. Let's also devote some attention to the number of parameters in our model. I count 11. How many do you count? Let me explain. I see five observed variables, each of which has one residual variance. The factor loading for the residual variance is not relevant because that is also fixed to one. I see five regression coefficients, which can also be called the factor loadings. Three for the internalizing factor and two more for the externalizing factor. And finally, I see one covariance, as indicated by the double-headed arrow between the two latent variables. Eleven parameters. Now it's also possible to scale these latent variables by fixing one of the factor loadings for each of the latent variables to be equal to one. We fix it to a constant value. This does not change the number of parameters in the model. Let's count again. Instead of five regression coefficients, we now have just three, because two of the regression coefficients have been fixed to be equal to one. But what has been freed are the variances of our latent variables. We freed two of the variances, which are now estimated. In other words, we've lost two of the parameters in terms of the regression coefficients and we've gained two parameters in terms of the latent variable variances. So we're left with the same number of parameters in the model. This type of scaling is the default setting in Lavan, but you could change it by using the argument std.lv equals true, standardized latent variables equals true. And this argument also indicates that by fixing the latent variable variances to be equal to one, we have in fact created standardized latent variables. So let's take a little technical intermezzo to discuss the issue of model identification. I've already explained in the first lecture that a model must be identified in order to be able to fit it. And identification means that we don't ever try to estimate more parameters than we have pieces of information. And a rule of thumb is 
to say the degrees of freedom of the model must be equal or greater than zero. So what were these degrees of freedom again? Well, the degrees of freedom are the number of pieces of information that we have left over when we take the number of observed variances and covariances and subtract the number of estimated parameters in our model. Remember that I explained that degrees of freedom are like our bank saldo, the number of parameters that we can still estimate. We start off with a certain number of known parameters, which are the observed variances and covariances in our data, and we want to estimate a certain number of parameters in our model. The degrees of freedom are the number of known pieces of information minus the estimated parameters. In other words, how many things could we still estimate if we wanted to? Now obviously that cannot be smaller than zero, because then we have more parameters than we are allowed to estimate. So here's another way to think about it. The degrees of freedom are the number of known pieces of information minus the number of unknown pieces of information. This also explains why the latent variables must be giving a scale by fixing a certain parameter. Otherwise, we are left with a greater number of unknown parameters than the number of known parameters. Remember that I gave this very simple example to make this intuitive to understand. I asked you a question. If I say a is equal to 5 minus 2, can you give me a solution for a? Of course, the solution is 3. But if I ask you, can you give me a solution for a equals 5 minus b? You can't, because the number of unknowns is greater than the number of knowns. In other words, the first problem is identified and the second problem is not identified. Note that I bring this up this week and I didn't bring it up last week when we discussed EFA. And this is because EFA is already identified by means of other restrictions. By default, the factor variances in EFA are also fixed to 1. The factor covariances are fixed to 0, although we can rotate the factor solution, which introduces a correlation. And instead of fixing one of the factor loadings to be equal to a constant, functions of multiple loadings are fixed to a constant. So now I want to discuss the issue of model fit for a moment. In the first week I already discussed the balance between model fit and model complexity, but let me just refresh your memory. A statistical model tries to explain the covariances between observed variables, and a good model is both simple and an adequate description of reality. We want the model that is simplest and still represents reality adequately well. Now, the larger the degrees of freedom are, the simpler our model is, and that is good. But every simpler model fits worse to the data by default. So here are two extremes of the scale. On the top half of the slide, we have a model that fits perfectly because each of the variances and covariances are estimated. There are zero degrees of freedom, and we call this a saturated model. On the bottom half of the slide, we see a very simple but poorly fitting model in which all of the variances are estimated, but none of the covariances. In other words, the covariances are assumed to be zero in the model. We call this the independence model because it states that every variable is independent from all of the other variables. If it wasn't independent, we would see some covariances. Our degrees of freedom are a balance that keeps track of the difference between the number of known and the number of estimated quantities. In other words, we can compute the degrees of freedom, or DF, as P minus Q, where P is the number of observed or known pieces of information, and Q is the number of unknown or estimated pieces of information. Any identified model has fewer parameters Q than the observed variances and covariances P, or at least they must be the same. So what constitutes a known piece of information in structural equation modeling? Well, let me remind you that the input for structural equation modeling is the variance-covariance matrix. And the number of observations constitutes the number of unique elements in this matrix. So let's look at a matrix on the bottom right of our slide. We see that the variances are on the diagonal. So where y1 meets y1, we see the variance of y1. And then just below that, where y2 meets y1, we see the covariance between y1 and y2. So we can fill the whole lower triangular of the matrix in this way. But let's look at the upper triangular. You see that if I go from Y1 to the right over to Y2, there's an empty cell. I made this empty to illustrate that this cell would contain this exact same information as if we go down from Y1 until we reach Y2, because the covariance between Y2 and Y1 
is the same as the covariance between y1 and y2. In other words, these are not unique pieces of information. So only the lower triangular contains unique pieces of information and we can add the diagonal to that. We can create a simple formula to calculate the number of unique elements given the number of variables and that is number of variables times number of variables plus one divided by two. Why do we do plus one? Well, because we want to add the diagonal to it. So p is the number of variables times number of variables plus one divided by two. So what are parameters in a structural equation model? Here are some examples. We can have the variances of an exogenous or predictor variable. We can have covariances amongst exogenous or predictor variables. We can have a regression or covariance between an exogenous predictor and an endogenous outcome variable. We can have residual variances for the outcome variables and we can have covariances between residual variances. So let's look at this simple diagram and count the number of parameters and define what they are. Let me start by identifying the variances of the predictors y1 and y2. They are also correlated, so there is one covariance between these. Then I see three residual variances, namely for y3, y4 and y5. I also see one more covariance between y3 and y4. Then I see four regression coefficients from y1 to y3, y2 to y4, and from y3 and y4 to y5. Count all of these up. There are Count all of these up. There are 11 estimated parameters. Now we also have a certain number of degrees of freedom, and this is equal to the number of observed variables, 5 times 5 plus 1, so 5 times 6 in total is 30 divided by 2 is 15. So we have 15 known pieces of information and we want to estimate 11 unknown pieces of information. That leaves us with four degrees of freedom. Our model is identified and we can estimate it. Now let's look at this example. So what do I see? I see one initial predictor variable, x, it has a variance. Then I see m1 and m2, those both have residual variances because they are predicted by x. I see y, which also has a residual variance because it's predicted by x, m1 and m2. Then I see one covariance between the residuals of m1 and m2. And I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 regression coefficients. Let's add these up. One initial variance plus three residual variances plus one covariance plus 5 regression coefficients equals 10 parameters. How many pieces of information do we know? Well, we have four predictors, so we can do 4 times 4 plus 1, that's 4 times 5 equals 20, divided by 2 is 10. We have 10 unique known pieces of information. We're also trying to estimate 10 parameters, so we have an equal number of known and unknown parameters, the degrees of freedom are equal to zero, our model is just identified, but it will be a perfect fit because we have one parameter for every unknown. Using this logic, we can also define the question of model fit. How well does the theoretical model fit the data? Now let's look at this very simple model. X has a regression onto Y with a residual variance for Y, and Y has a regression onto Z with a residual variance for Z. We don't see a direct effect from x onto z. So this model implies a certain covariance structure. And specifically it implies that the covariance between x and z will be lower than the other two covariances. Because the covariance between x and z is obtained by multiplying the covariance between x and y with the one between y and z. So it will always be smaller. This model has fewer parameters than it could have because we could also include a direct effect between x and z. So model fit addresses the question of how close this model implied covariance matrix is to the observed covariance matrix. And specifically in the observed covariance matrix, there will be a covariance between X and Z, but our model implied covariance matrix says that this is somewhat smaller. We estimate our model using maximum likelihood estimation. Now I'm gonna show you a formula, which you don't need to know, but it's helpful to get a little bit of an intuition for what it means. First, let me define three things. K is defined as the number of observed variables. 
S is the sample covariance matrix. In other words, it's the observed covariance matrix from our data. Sigma is the model implied covariance matrix. Now, maximum likelihood estimation tries to minimize the objective function, and that function is given as F sub ML, and is equal to the log of absolute sigma minus the log of absolute S, plus the trace of S times sigma inverse, minus the number of observed variables K. So this log of absolute sigma minus log of absolute S relates to the difference between sigma and S. So how big is that difference? And this trace relates to how big is the diagonal minus the number of parameters K. So basically what we see here is that this calculates the difference between the observed and the model implied covariance matrices. From this objective function, we can obtain a chi-square st test statistic for the model. And this chi-square is given by taking the number of participants minus one, multiplied by the minimum value of the objective function. With the degrees of freedom, which we calculated before, equals to P minus Q. Now we have a test statistic for the model fit. And this test statistic is asymptotically chi-square distributed with the degrees of freedom equal to P minus Q. So what hypothesis are we testing when we conduct a chi-square test? Well, the null hypothesis is that the population covariance matrix is equal to the model implied covariance matrix. The alternative hypothesis is that these two are not the same. Now, because we're calculating squared deviations between the two, we can use a chi-square test statistic, which only takes on positive values. So let's take the sample covariance matrix S to be an estimator of the population covariance matrix sigma population. If we then reject the null hypothesis with a p smaller than 0.05, this means that our model fits the data poorly. In other words, it would be unlikely to observe this sample covariance matrix if the population covariance matrix was equal to the model implied covariance matrix. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis, so p is bigger than 0.05, this means that the model fits the data relatively well. It would not be surprising to observe this sample covariance matrix if the population covariance matrix was equal to the model implied covariance matrix. So let's look at an example of the sample covariance matrix versus the model implied covariance matrix. Let's do a simple linear regression between the time spent studying and the grade obtained for this course. We have an initial predicted time study, which has a variance, and it predicts your grade, which will have a residual variance epsilon and a regression coefficient from time spent studying to the grade. This is our observed variance covariance matrix. We see the variances of time spent studying and of the grade, and we see a covariance between the two. Now we can assign symbols to each of the coefficients in this model. Specifically, we have sigma square sub y1 for time spent studying. We have a regression coefficient called b sub 1 for the regression. And our residual variance is sigma square sub epsilon. We could also write this as a formula which says every individual grade, grade sub i, is equal to some regression slope b sub 1 times the time spent studying for every individual sub i plus prediction error for every individual sub i and the prediction errors are normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma square sub e. Now let's look at the covariance matrix implied by that model. We see that time spent studying still has its original variance, sigma square sub y1. But we see that the covariance between grade and time spent studying has been replaced by the regression coefficient b sub 1. We also see that the variance of grade has now become a function of the regression coefficient times the variance of time spent studying plus all of the residual variance. Another way to look at it is that the variance of grade has been broken up into a part that is explained by time spent studying, that is the b square sub 1 times sigma square sub y1 and an unexplained part which is sigma square sub e. So the variance in grade has been split up into two parts, the explained part and the unexplained part. Now let's enter some numbers. Let's say that the variance of time spent studying is 1, the variance of grade is 1.5, and the covariance between grade and time spent studying is 
For our regression model, we would then observe, of course, the variance of the initial predictor is still 1, the regression slope is 0.3, and the residual variance of grade is 1.41. Now let's fill in the functions of the model implied covariance matrix. Then we can see that the variance of time spent studying is still equal to 1, the covariance is still equal to 0.3, and the variance of grade, as I mentioned before, is split up into two parts, the explained and the unexplained part. The explained part is the initial variance of time spent studying times the regression slope squared, so that is 0.09 plus the unexplained variance, which is indeed 1.41. If you add those two up, you get 1.5, and the model implied covariance matrix turns out to be identical to the observed covariance matrix. And that makes sense, because we had three parameters and we estimated three parameters, so the model is just identified. We have one parameter for every piece of information, and we end up with an identical observed and modeled covariance matrix. This has a perfect fit, so we have zero degrees of freedom. Now let's look at another example, a slightly more complicated one. Here we have a latent variable model with two variables, four indicators. The latent variables have variances, the indicators have residual variances, and there's a covariance between the two latent variables. Now we fix the latent variable variances to be equal to one for model identification, and of course, the loadings of the error terms are all equal to 1. So now we can label all of the remaining parameters. We see a row for the correlation, we see betas for the factor loadings, and we see sigma squared for all of the residual variances. The number of observed variables is 4, which means that p, the number of unique pieces of information, equals to 10. And we're going to estimate 9 parameters. Which 9? The factor correlation, four factor loadings and four residual variances. So we have one degree of freedom left. This is the sample covariance matrix from our data and we have data from 543 participants. We can derive the model implied covariance matrix using the tracing rules which are explained if you follow this web link but it's not necessarily material for this course but it works the same as in our linear regression example. Let's look at this model implied covariance matrix. We see that the variance of the first indicator is equal to the first loading squared plus the residual variance of the first item. And the same applies for each of the other item variances. But if we look at the covariance between the first item and the second item, we see that this is equal to the first factor loading times the second factor loading. So these are multiplied together. And that is what the tracing rule means. We can start with item one and go to item two, and we have to multiply and sum up all of the paths by which we can get from item one to item two. Now, in this case, there's only one path, namely from item one through factor one to item two. In doing so, we pass through beta one and beta two, so we have to multiply beta one with beta two to obtain the model implied covariance between those two items. So after estimating the model, we here on the top half of the slide we have the observed covariance matrix, on the bottom half of the slide we have the model implied covariance matrix, and we can get a chi-square test. This chi-square is a value of 5.28 with one degree of freedom and a significant p-value of 0.02. In other words, it would be unlikely to obtain this sample covariance matrix if the model implied covariance matrix was equal to the population covariance matrix. Another way of putting this is that our model fits significantly worse than a fully saturated model. So what do we do now? We have a poorly fitting model. What is our next step? Well, as it turns out, there's a problem with the chi-square. And the problem is that if we have a very large sample size n, then we have very high power to detect even small discrepancies between the observed and model implied covariance matrices. And in practice, we often find that the chi-square is always significant. If we have a small n, on the other hand, we have very low power to detect large discrepancies between the observed and model implied covariance matrices. And we end up with a chi-square that is usually not significant. In other words, chi-square is very dependent on your sample size.
but it's not always reliable to detect meaningful differences between the observed and model implied covariance matrices. So in practice what we end up doing is that we always report the chi-square, df and p-value, but we focus our attention on other fit indices as well. So what are these other fit indices? Well, first of all, we have the root mean squared error of approximation, known for short as RMSEA. This, if we look at the formula, is a function of the chi-square degrees of freedom and the sample size. In other words, it's a transformation of the chi-square. Now, because the denominator contains n minus 1, and the chi-square also contains n minus 1, we've standardized the chi-square in a certain way for the number of participants. And this puts RMSEA on a 0 to 1 type of scale. Very small values of RMSEA indicate a good fit. And a rule of thumb can be that if it's smaller than 0 0.05, that's a very close fit. Smaller than 0 0.08, it's an acceptable fit. But if it's bigger than 0.10, that's definitely a bad fit. A word of warning, RMSEA is unreliable with a small n and a small degree of freedom. But then again, every statistic becomes more reliable with a larger number of participants. We can also compute the comparative fit index, known as CFI, which is a chi-square comparison to the baseline model. The CFI also is a statistic scaled from 0 to 1, so it's standardized and easy to interpret. And our rule of thumb is that if it's smaller than 0.90, then it has a bad fit. And if it's bigger than 0.95, it has a good fit. Anywhere between 0.90 and 0.95 is questionable. We do know that the CFI tends to be quite low when the correlations between observed variables are low. And this is because of the baseline model it uses, which we will get to in a second. So let's look for a moment at the model fit that we obtain from Lavan. If we ask for a summary of our fit model, we can include the argument fit measures equals true which gives us a table of output with several fit measures. First of all, we see a model test for a user model, which is the chi-square of the model that we specified. But below that, we see a model test of the baseline model. So what is this? Well, this is in fact a chi-square test of a rudimentary default model. And we get this so we can compare the fit of our model to that of a default model. So what is this baseline model? Typically it is the independence model which, is a model, which is a model that specifies only variances of the observed variables and therefore all covariances have been fixed to be equal to zero. If we scroll down in the output, we see the user model versus baseline model fit indices. And it's nice that this is how the indices are labeled because this emphasizes that we are looking at relative fit indices, comparing two models. Which two models? Our model versus the independence model. So here we see that the CFI has a value of 0.88 and the TLI has a value of 0.84. TLI is interpreted on the same scale as the CFI. Then we see log likelihood, we see AIC, BIC, and we see the RMSEA. And the RMSEA in this case is 0.11. All of these fit indices point that a bad fit of our model. The AIC and the BIC are interpreted simply as such, a lower value is better, but they are not on any standardized scale. And the SRMR is interpreted somewhat similar to the RMSEA in that values smaller than 0.10 indicate acceptable fit. So here we're in a situation where the model has poor fit according to most indices. And what do we do if the model doesn't fit? Well, we don't interpret the parameter estimates. The poor fit indicates that there are some serious deviations between the model implied and observed covariance matrices, and therefore the parameter estimates could be misleading. What we could do is revisit the theory and make sure that our model accurately represents it, or we could modify the model to accommodate for any paths that have been misspecified. So let's have a quick look at this factor analysis. We have here nine items which are explained by three latent variables. Our theory said that the first three items belong to a factor called motivation, the next three belong to a factor called satisfaction, and the final three belong to a factor called self-confidence. However, we obtained a poor fit 
And we found that if we include a cross-loading from self-confidence onto the item acceptance, which belongs with the satisfaction scale, and if we allowed a residual correlation between the residuals of fun and social skills, then our model fit does become acceptable. So you could decide to make these data-driven changes to the model. Another example might be that we have 12 items which are all designed to measure mathematical ability. But as indicated in the fit indices on the top left, RMSEA is acceptable but CFI is too low. Well, in this case it could be that items 7 through 12 were not just measures of mathematical ability, but they were also measured in terms of reaction time. So we could hypothesize, after observing the poor fit, that mathematical questions, which are timed, might not only tap into mathematical ability, but also into people's speed. If we include a second factor that is allowed to load on all of the timed items, then we observe that the RMSEA is very low, so it's very good, and the CFI is very high, so that's also very good. And our model fit has become more than acceptable. Because we now have two what we call nested models, which means that if we simplify one of them, we end up with the other one, we can compare the chi-squares of these two models. And we find that a comparison of these chi-squares is also chi-square distributed, with the degrees of freedom equal to the number of added parameters. And the significance of this chi-square test is smaller than 0.01. In other words, adding this speed factor has significantly improved the fit of the model. So here is the result from a published paper where they indeed included the speed factor and then they also included age and gender as control variables on two of the items, Y1 and Y2, and they included correlations between age and gender and mathematical ability and speed. And this final model had a very good fit as indicated by the fit indices below the image. Now I just want to give you a small preview of what we're going to be looking at in the coming lectures. After you've done confirmatory factor analysis, it is possible to extend the model and include outcome measures or predictors and any kind of regression effects that you want to include. Now in the first lecture I explained that this combination of factor analysis and regression is called structural equation modeling. And the major advantages of this technique is that you estimate all of your parameters in one go, rather than estimating many analyses and step by step piecing together your model. Another advantage is that by including a measurement model in your regression, you can control for measurement error. And a final advantage is that you can test the fit of your entire theoretical model with just one fit statistic. Another possible extension is to create a so-called second order CFA. And this means that we estimate a factor analysis onto the latent variables of a first order CFA. So in this image we see several observed variables. Each combination of three observed variables uh, measures a latent variable. And then all of those latent variables in turn serve as indicators for a second order latent variable. So in what circumstances could a second order latent variable model be useful? Well, for example, when there are multiple factors which can be explained by some common theoretical construct. For example, IQ tests typically have subtests for different types of intelligence. Now, ideally, when you do estimate a second order CFA, you would want to have more than two first order factors in order to ensure that your model is identified at the second order level. But I have some critical thoughts about second order latent variable models. Because a second order CFA is a more complex model than the first order CFA, it will by definition always fit better. If the model fit is bad, that means that your model doesn't describe reality very well. But good fit does not necessarily mean that the second order factor exists in reality. It just means that the model implied covariance matrix does not deviate significantly from the observed one. Also keep in mind that instead of a second order CFA, you could just allow the first order factors to be correlated. The second order factor just means you have a theory that says all of those correlations are explained by one latent variable. But it's not necessary to assume the existence of that second order factor. All right, that wraps up the new material for this week. 
Let's do a quick learning check before we get a preview of next week. PCA is best used to give a summary of the variance of several items when we just want to extract one common component that explains the most variance in all of the items. EFA is a simple model-based approach where each of the items can load onto multiple factors and we can use it to check how many factors are in the data. Finally, CFA is used when we have a strong theoretical model to check whether this model is supported by the observed data. Until now, we've modeled only the variances and covariances. And that means that we have ignored any means or intercepts of the variables in our model. For example, if we look at this linear regression, we might say that grade also has an intercept and then for every hour you study, you get a little bonus on your grade. Now thus far, the intercept has been omitted from the functions and from the models themselves. But recall from your basic statistics that every observed variable has a mean. And in structural equation modeling, we can also estimate this mean and we can estimate an intercept for variables that are predicted by other variables. In structural equation modeling, you can generally choose whether to estimate means and intercept or not to do so. If you choose not to estimate means, then your data constitute the observed covariance matrix and your model constitutes a model implied covariance matrix. If you do include means, then you will also add a vector of means to your observed data and a vector of estimated means and intercepts to your model. Including the mean vector will result in a different number of estimated parameters. But surprisingly, it does not change our model's degrees of freedom. And this is because we add Z observed means to the data and we also estimate Z means or intercepts in our model. So the number of additional pieces of information and additional unknown pieces of information are the same. This topic will be covered in more detail in the coming weeks when we discuss general linear modeling and multi-group models.